once again, we are reminded of the sacrifice. And all of this ties in very well with what we're going to talk about today. You know, words have meaning. That's just a simple truth. Without having meanings, we can't communicate. Unfortunately, a lot of times when I'm talking, I may be talking and having one thought in mind, one meaning of a word in mind, and you may have another. Because lots of words have multiple meanings. Is that not true? I have several times talked to somebody, in fact, had disagreements with somebody, and then all of a sudden we realize he's talking about apples and I'm talking about oranges, so to speak. And all of a sudden when we are on the same page as far as meanings, we go, oh yeah, we understand that. The truth of the matter is, is sometimes words are misconstrued. Sometimes the definitions are twisted, distorted, or sometimes just incomplete. The truth of the matter is, is the word church is one of those words that has a lot of different meanings. Several of them are not wrong, but they're incomplete. Some of them are wrong. A lot of times we talk about the church, and if I say the word church, you think of a building. But the Bible never talks about the church as a building. Did you know that? Actually, this is a church building. The church is an adjective defining what kind of church is, but the building, the church is actually not, not this here. When we're gone, the church is gone as well, amen? Um, some would think of it as a denomination. Some think of it as a certain... Um, never know what's going to happen with us. Some, some would think of it as, as, as uh, a membership. They attend someplace. But as we look in the Word of God, I back up, I move forward. But as we, as we look at the, at the Word of God, let's just use this today. And we will not worry about that for this time. Yeah, I've taken this off, and that causes more trouble than trying to... We'll just do it like this. Ignore that, okay? The thing is, is a lot of people don't have the right idea of what the church is. And so because of that, when I talk about the church, we're communicating on two different levels. And so for the next few weeks, I want us to talk about essential elements of Christ's church. Essential elements of Christ's church. And we're going to look at four important things that are defined, if you'll pay attention, with one common thread through all of it. We're going to see that a true church preaches the word together. It practices worship together. It proclaims its witness together. And it participates in work together. Have you caught one word that continues to be through that? Together. You see, the church is not when we're watching on TV, although I'm thankful for those that are. But I want to tell you something. When the coronavirus is over or if your sickness is over, you need to be at church. You need to be together. Because that's what God wants us to have. And we're going to look at that. And we're going to find out that the church, this is a definition, the church is a united group of baptized believers that are con individually committed to fulfilling the essential elements of the New Testament. Say, what do you mean? In other words, when everybody is on board, the church can do something great. It's not when I just say this is what we're supposed to do. But when everybody gets on the same page, amazing things can happen and did happen in the time of the New Testament. And it can happen here. I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for the members of our church. I'm thankful for those that are part of this group together. But as we are going to look at today, we're gonna, we, are, we constantly need to be reminded. Because if this is what the church is, then it must be important to God. And if it's important to God, guess who else it's important to? Satan. Satan th wants to make our church not do this, not be together, not preach the word, not, not participate in worship and, and witnessing and, and, and work. And so today we want to begin with a word. In fact, we're going to spend a couple weeks on this because we want to look at the centrality of our preaching and then the basis of it in the next couple of weeks. You know, a lot of times when people talk about the word preaching, they got a lot of different ideas. 
Some people think, well, it's, it's, it's jumping up and down and saying something about God. That's not necessarily preaching. I'm not opposed to that, but that's not necessarily preaching. Some want to give a teaching lesson, and that's not necessarily getting to the heart of preaching the Word of God. Some have a religious or theological bent. Some want to just make us feel better. Huh? And in fact, because of that, a lot of people jump from church to church to church because they want to feel good about where they go to church and what they feel when they leave the church. And so they're never going to be satisfied, never going to be happy. But we're going to find out today that biblical preaching, preaching, real preaching is about Christ. And preaching without Christ is not true Bible preaching. In other words, at Davidson Baptist Church, and every church that preaches the gospel, Christ is central. That doesn't mean we always just give the gospel, but it touches. The gospel always if, if impacts and affects what we preach and how we preach it. And so we're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1 today, and we're going to look at a couple verses. If you would stand with me as we start in verse number 17. We're going to read a few verses and then jump down. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. Paul, speaking to this church, says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to them which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now verse 27, jump down there. And it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray. As we look into your word, Father, we want to be reminded today of the wonder of the cross. Lord, without the cross, we have nothing to preach about. We have no basis for anything else that we might talk about. We have no hope of eternal life. We have no hope of a future with you. We have no reason to live a godly life. We have nothing to based if we do not know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And there is no promise that you will ever love us outside of the death of Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you will minister to our hearts now. And teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've shared this before, but growing up, I attended a Baptist church. Every Sunday, we were there. In fact, we were involved in other things. Even as a young man, I was involved in the choir. I know you can't believe that, but I was involved in the choir. Uh, we were faithful and active as much as that church was, uh, as far as they were t the things that they had. I was even baptized. And yet, later on, my parents realized that there had to be something more to religion, as they put it at that time, than what we were getting. They didn't know that what it was was Jesus. And so we went to another church. I didn't want to go. I am a creature of habit, and I like things the same. And I did not want to go. But I went to that church, and the first Sunday there, I loved my Sunday school teacher, Chuck Hackney. He made it interesting. When I left Sunday school, I said, I'm going to come back. That encouraged my parents. But then we went to the service. We sat right back there where the backslidden people sat. I mean, where <laughs> right about where Jeremy's at right now. <laughs> you want to name somebody? No. And we sat there. And for the first time, I heard why. Why we went to church. What was this all about? 
What was it important? And I heard about Jesus Christ. I knew he di died. I'm not even blaming that other church. It may have been partially because I was young at that time. But at 12 years old, I understood, and God dealt with my heart. And, and then at the end of the ser service, they did something really weird. They had an invitation. I had never seen one before. And, and that night, I, day, I almost went forward. But, hey, I'm, believe it or not, I am a little bashful. You don't believe that, some of you. But I was, and uh, I didn't go forward. We kept going back to that church, and I loved it. We got very much attending it. We already had forgotten about the other church that we'd gone to for probably seven or eight years. And then each service, God dealt with my heart about Christ and my sin. The church was participating in a citywide revival. And at that revival, I still remember the message on the cross of Christ. I didn't get saved that night, but all night long, all the next day, all I could think about was what Christ had done for me. And I knew I needed to do something. My parents, who were not even saved, when I told them, they said, if God's dealing with your heart, you obey him. Now, here's somebody not even saved. And they're knowing that what I wanted was right. That next night, my dad wasn't able to come, but my mom and I and my grandparents went. And in that service, my mom went forward. And right behind her, I went. That night, I trusted Christ as my Savior. And everything changed. My goals changed. My desires changed. My life changed. The direction of my life changed. I would not be who I am, where I am, or anything else if it wasn't for that day, now over 50 years, when Christ changed my life. I didn't need religion. I had plenty of that. In fact, I had Bible knowledge. Even at that age, I was giving my Sunday school teachers a rough time because I was asking questions. I didn't need Bible knowledge. I, I, not that it's wrong, but I had enough. What I needed was Jesus. And today, as we look into the Word of God, we need to understand that a Bible-preaching church is one that proclaims Jesus Christ. And out of that, everything else flows. This does not mean that every Sunday is a salvation message. Oh, no. Because this Bible has much more than that. But everything in this Bible is somehow touched affected and tied together to the gospel and the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so in this passage of scripture that we're looking at today, we want to look at a couple things that are important concerning the cross of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And what we find out is, first of all, because we said preaching without Christ is not biblical preaching, we find out, first of all, the gospel of Jesus is the central message of the church the gospel of Jesus Christ is the central message of the church. Notice what it said in verse 17. Paul makes this very clear. I came not, Christ sent me not to do what? To baptize. Now, he's not saying baptism is wrong. In fact, he says he did baptize a few people maybe. He wasn't against it. In fact, he commanded it at places and others did. He had been baptized. But the gospel is not about being baptized because if it's about being baptized, it's about a work. But notice what his heartbeat was. He says, but to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. We must understand. Do you understand what your neighbors need? Do you understand what your children need? Young people, I care not how old or how young you are. What you need is Jesus, and you need the gospel. And as Mr. Jeff said, the love of God is a love that is founded in Jesus Christ, and without it you have not the love of God. We need to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the focus, and if it's the focus, then it must be very important to God. That's the reason why the devil doesn't like it. 
That's the reason why many churches minimize it. Oh, they might mention Jesus every once in a while. They might mention the cross occasionally. But they don't want to get too bogged down in sin. They don't want to talk too much about you needing to be saved and, and you need your life changed. They want to talk about how you can improve yourself, how you can do better. And they will even give you Bible verses. See, that's the thing that bothers me, and we're going to talk in a minute. To be, to be quite honest with you, most, Bible, most Christians do not even know what Bible preaching is. If somebody mentions a verse, then it's preaching. Can I tell you something? The devil quotes the Bible better than you and I do. He did it to Jesus, and he will do it to you and I. It is not my job to make the Bible relevant. I am tired of people saying we need to make the Bible relevant. The Bible is relevant. It meets the needs of your heart and mine, and nothing can make it relevant and the more I try to make it relevant, I will make it ineffective, which is what he says next. If we're not careful, we will take away the power of the gospel. Notice it says, Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Do you understand that preachers around the world are making the gospel worthless? Because they don't talk about it. They're talking about how you need to improve your life, how you need to have a, this added to your life or that added to your life. And it's about Jesus plus a lot of other things, but they focus on the other things. What you need is Jesus, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. The gospel is the central message, and if you're here without the gospel, you are here without hope. You are here without life. And I want you to t tell you something. While, while we spend time studying the Word of God, while we spend time preparing a message, it is the power of the gospel, not the power of my words that save people. Do you understand? It's not about me, as we will look at in a minute. Not my cunning, it's God. Now, how somebody views the cross reveals who they are. Notice what it says in verse 18 and 19. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. What is it? Foolishness. In other words, you know why some people don't want to hear about the gospel? They want to hear about how they can improve their life, how they can make their marriage better, how they can do this, how they can do that. And they go to a church that's going to have a, a, a wonderful little ditty here or this or that, but they don't want to deal with their sin. You know why? Because the Bible isn't necessarily foolish, but the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the gospel, that's what's foolishness to them. They want something without dealing with them, their own sin. Today, there will be millions of people on their way to hell in a church. Think about it. And they will leave that church knowing how to be a little happier, how to take care of their finances a little bit more, how to do this or that or fix their marriage, but they won't know about Jesus and the cross. Or if they do, it'll be just something that they add on where this needs to be central. Notice, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But notice, but unto us. Notice, them, us. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. Do you understand what we need today? Do you know what your neighbor needs? Do you know what can met, fix the mess that people are in? Just today I had a, had a, a, a person write me uh, through Facebook, and they were talking about the fact that, that there's two fellas that he asked prayer for that need, they were raised in good homes, but they've gone the wrong way. They need to be saved. You see, the, fa the fact is, is the problem was not that they need to get off from drugs, although they did. 
The problem was not that they need to clean up their life, although they do, but what they really needed was the gospel because it's the power of God. You see, Romans 1 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? Not a power of God, but the power of God unto salvation. The Bible does not give us a multiple choice answer on how a person must be saved. There is one answer, one answer only, and if you reject that answer, you have no answer. You have no hope. Second Peter chapter 2, on the other end, remember we said power and foolishness, says this about false teachers. These are wells without water. Now let me ask them, what good is a well without water? It is no good. It is clouds carried by a tempest. It says, for they speak great swelling words of emptiness. I love that. They talk big, but they don't contain anything. Just like a well without water, their words have no power to change. It says, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those that, who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Here's a person that's preaching, and he's saying, this is how you get rid of these problems, but they themselves secretly are entrapped by those very sins. You see, that's the problem of preachers without the gospel, of religion without Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the second thing. We've talked about the gospel, but we need to understand that the gospel is not just something abstract, but that the person of Christ is the center point of the gospel. It's not just about a story about a person who lived and died. It's not just about believing in God. Please don't mention that. I have had so many people in recent days say something like, well, I still believe in God. That tells me that they have never been saved. If that's what they think being saved is about, is I believe in God. I've had people look at me and say, you know what? So-and-so doesn't believe in God. And yet they themselves never have darkened the door of church, and they somehow think believing in God is going to get them saved or get them to heaven. The truth of the matter is, Verse 23 of the same chapter point, tells us what it's all about. It says, verse 23, For we preach who? Christ. Crucified. We preach Christ. Now that word literally means Messiah. It's the word anointed one. And as we look at that, we find on out that it is our job not to talk about religion. It's not even just to talk about God, although we do that, obviously. But everything that I have in God, the reason I'm going to be loved by God and am loved by God, the reason I have a home in heaven, all that I have is because of a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. His perfect life qualified him to be my Savior, and his death, burial, and resurrection actually does the saving. You've got to understand, from the... You, a lot of people have said, well, I, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. How crazy is that? As I look at the Old Testament, you start on out in chapter 1 of Genesis, and it says, let us make man in our own image. And God is talking to the Father, and, uh, the Son, and the Spirit. And they together make this earth. And we learn that Jesus has power. And it's mentioned again in Colossians. Just two chapters later, when man falls into sin... God says, you know what, someday, Eve, you're going to have a son, and he is going to stomp the head of the serpent. Satan's going to be destroyed, and we see that promise. A few chapters later, Abraham is promised that in him and his seed will all the families of the world be blessed. And as you go down through the Old Testament, you see a little more picture of Jesus and a little bigger picture of Jesus. I was reading and going through Isaiah this week, and I was astounded once again at how many passages talk about Messiah, the Anointed One. It is because of Him that we have hope of eternal life. In the Old Testament, Jesus was concealed. In the New Testament, Jesus is revealed. It is because of Him that I see backwards, and I see all that God has promised, but that's not all. 
It's because of the cross and his salvation that I have not only hope in this life, but I have an eternity with Jesus Christ coming to rule and reign. Amen? The cross makes that a reality. Eternity is a reality because of the cross of Christ. It is about Jesus. We need to understand Jesus makes all the difference in the world. We want to make sure people understand exactly, however, who Jesus is. It concerns me when people somehow see Jesus as just a big buddy. I remember a few years ago, I saw a t-shirt. I wanted to just rip it off the, the back of the person. It says, Jesus is my homeboy. I want to tell you something. Don't you ever be that disrespectful to Jesus. He is your Savior. He is your Lord. Yes, he is my friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he is, he is my brother, the Bible teaches also. But I am reverent of him because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we need to understand that this world wants to make Jesus just a kind of guy that, oh, he'll, he, he loves everybody and he's never going to say you're wrong and he's never going to make anybody feel bad. And yet the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is my Savior, he is my Lord, he is my friend, but he's more than that. In the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is afraid of that very problem. And he says this to those folks. He says, but I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, in other words, the devil had fooled Eve, so your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches Another Jesus. What Jesus do we preach? The one that's found in this book. The one that, yes, brings comfort, but also sometimes he makes me uncomfortable. The one that gives me hope, but the one that also reveals that I am a sinner that needs a Savior. This is, the, this is how I form my view of Jesus, not what the world wants me. and not, That's how this church is going to view Jesus, from the book. We don't need what the world wants to give us as far as Jesus. He says, I'm afraid that if someone preaches another Jesus whom you have not, we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit that you've not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Friend, it's very easy to let somebody come in and preach a different Jesus. All they got to do is mention Jesus, and that's enough for most folks. I want you to know, in this church, we want to know what Jesus is like. We want to know the real Jesus. I love what the Bible says in the one gospel serves, we would see Jesus. I want my people to know Jesus. I want them to know how much he loved them so that he, sent, he was sent to die for them. I want them to know how he willingly sacrificed his perfect, sinless life so that I might have salvation. You see, without Jesus, everybody's in the same shape. The, the religious and the atheists, the false Christian and the Buddhist, the moral and the very immoral have the same destiny because they all lack Christ's payment for their sin. You see, the gospel is the thing that changes lives. If you look at the life of Paul, you know what you find? Three times in the Bible, his testimony of what he went through and how God saved him is mentioned. Now there's some various reasons for that, but here's the thing I want you to get across to you today. He, not, he never got over his salvation experience. Jesus had changed him, and he never got tired of sharing it. Friends, you may not know exactly what to tell people, but you can always tell them about Jesus saving you. You have that ability. Now, why does God, why is God so narrow? Why is God so strict in saying, it's not about religion, it's not about church, it's not about anything else, it's about Jesus? Well, that's given in the last few verses that we read. And we find this last thing, and that's this. The true gospel magnifies God and humbles man. The true gospel is not about me getting better, or bragging about my goodness. Do you remember what Ephesians says? 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Boast. I don't care how small of a work it is. If you do something for your salvation, you're going to find a way to boast about it. Even if it's that you think that you've got to hold on, you will brag about your holding on to Jesus. Friends, you don't hold on to Jesus. You don't have that strong a grip. It's God that holds on to you. And that's why we have eternal life. Bottom line is, in this passage of Scripture, he has just read in verses 20, uh, 27, earlier in, than this, he talked about how not many wise, how, uh, verse 26, how not many wise after the flesh, how not many noble, how many mighty are called. In other words, not the great people of this world. God doesn't look and say, give me the rich people. Give me the smartest people. Give me the people of nobility, and I will let them go to heaven. Let me tell you something. I don't think anyone here would qualify unless you, unless you got more money than I know about. Bill, you, you make it in that one? <laughs> no, he's got three girls. He don't have no money. <laughs> I know how that goes. So you'd have no hope if, it was on a, if you, were, you had to be in the top 2%, right? Anybody here make How about the smartest? Not even going to go down that road. Margaret? I mean, <laughs> nobility? Now, now, we can, Bill has done his genealogy, and he does go back to some royalty. Maybe, maybe you could get in on that, but it's so distant, who knows? But see, aren't you glad that's not based on that? Because you know what that would mean? Most of us here would have no hope. But the Bible goes and says God has chosen the foolish things the weak things, and so forth. You know what you are? You're a foolish thing. You're a weak thing. And God, in His mercy, saved you so you can say, you know what, it's not about me, but it's about Jesus. You see, the reason why He did that was if I could get to heaven based on some heritage or ability or skill... First of all, I would brag about it. I'd brag about it here, and then I'd think that I could brag about it in heaven. But notice why he said this. Verse 29. So that most flesh cannot... No, uh, that's not what it says, it, does it? So that no flesh can glory in his presence. No flesh. You know why God saved me the way he did? The way he does everybody? is because it makes people humble because they got to see themselves as a sinner. Man, people don't like that. People want to hide their sin. They want to they want to inflate their righteousness. They want to look good and God says, "No. Nobody's going to be able to glory. I have nothing to glory about, neither do you." And he says that no flesh should glory in his sight. But then who does get to glory? Or what do we get to glory about? Well, our call to worship said that today. God forbid that I should glory or boast. And in this passage, verse 31 says, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see, in the book of 2 Corinthians, it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. You know, this church isn't about Pete Yeomans. It's not about the deacons. It's not about the membership. And too many times it's about us. I, I, it breaks my heart when folks get upset with the church or get upset, and it's always about them. Have you, have you noticed that? Most people get upset with church because something about them, but they forget about Jesus. They forget that he humbled himself. And it's not about you. I'll be honest with you. There's some preachers that really don't want to preach. They just want to perform. But friends, if you leave here without knowing a little bit about me, that's okay. Today I gave my testimony, but it was about Jesus. But if you don't know anything about me, that's fine. But if you don't know anything about Jesus, you've missed out. And we need to understand that all of this, all of the Bible, all of our life, all of how we're supposed to live our life, and we're going to talk about that next week, is tied in with this Bible 
And how I live and how I act and how I treat others is because of what Jesus Christ has done for me and what he's done for you. The truth of the matter is, is that there are a lot of people that don't know Jesus. They know religion. They know what the church believes, maybe, but they know, don't know Jesus. Friends, the cross should have affected your life. If you're a Christian, I don't care if you're young, you're old. I don't care if you're an old man or a teenager. I care not. The cross is supposed to change your life. If the cross and Christ are not enough for you to love and glorify God, then you don't, don't know enough about him. You need to get to know him better. God did not save you so that you might exploit your freedom and say, oh, I'm saved, I get to live like I want to. It's not about you exo exploiting your freedom, but it's about you exalting your Savior. And that's what it's all about. You see, I found out a long time ago that we are always going to brag about something. That's who we are. We brag about, we'll find something. Our favorite hobby, our favorite team, our family. We find something. And now some of those things aren't necessarily wrong, but let me tell you something. Too many people are wrapped up in things that are going to go away. Today's the Super Bowl. Big day. Everybody thinks about it. But here's the thing. How many of you can name, I mean, these, this is a bit, how many of you can name all the winners of every Super Bowl? How many of you can remember even last year's? Some of you may. They're in it this year again. But you know what? Go back a year, two years, three years. You see, this world and everything about it fades. But the word of God and the person of Christ and the gospel will be forever. You see, I like what it, the Bible teaches, and I think it's true, that the only thing handmade in heaven are the nail-pierced hands of Jesus to remind us of what he did so that we might have eternal life and so that we might share it with the others. Our preaching is about Jesus. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, can I tell you, today is the day to be saved. If you're here and you are struggling with some things, Maybe it's because you've got your focus off from Jesus. Our mind reacts to how we think. And if we've not been thinking and dwelling on Jesus, we're going to have problems. Some of us may say, you know what? I have forgotten about Christ. And my life has not honored him. You need to get back to the cross and get right with God. The cross changes everything. It's a game changer, and it can change you. Would you bow with me for prayer? In a moment, we are going to have our invitation. Sometimes we're too proud to come forward and just bear our souls to God. But I encourage you to do that if he's dealt with your heart today. If you're lost, I urge you to come, and we will take the word of God and show you how you can be saved today. If you're a believer, it's so easy to forget about the cross not that we don't remember it but it ceases to impact our lives today I encourage you to get that right with the Lord that's the reason we're struggling is our eyes are off from Jesus Father thank you for the cross what it means to us how it has changed us and only in eternity will we understand all the glory of it. But Lord, I pray you'll teach us even today and help us to love you. And I do pray for those that are here that have never experienced the forgiveness of sin. Their, their, their relationship with you is non-existent. Help them to realize that today is the day that you're urging them to come and be saved. In Jesus' name.